Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Ron Line Report. Today's guest was the very first NPC National overall men's physique champion in 2011. He's won six, I believe, six pro shows in men's physique. Was third place at the Olympia uh, the first year they had men's physique, I believe. We'll get, we'll get more about that. Please welcome from New York, Matt Acton. How are you, Matt? How are you doing, everybody? Thank you, Ron. And, you know, thanks to MD for giving me a shot to get back out there, you know. I was wondering, well, what's going on with this guy? But we're going to find out. We're going to find out. Uh, so I want to get a little background. You know, you were, uh, were you always an athletic kid when you were growing up? What kind of sports and hobbies were you into? Well, I was pretty much, uh, I, I played almost every sport, but I really excelled in baseball. Mm. So, you know, after I got to, uh, you know, college, it, it wound up, you know, you got to choose. You got to work. You got to play a sport. You know, you got to go to school. So it's kind of like you, sometimes if you're playing D3, it's not always worth it. You know, because you got to show up before school, you know, you got to do all this stuff that goes into, you know, practice and this and that. And listen, I'm down for it. But when you're at that age, it's kind of like, what's more important? Is it making money and, you know, focusing on school or is it playing D3, which you're not really getting paid to do at that point? Meaning like, you know, you're not getting a scholarship or nothing really comes out of it. So for me, it was more of a transition, you know, into actually MMA to tell you the truth and I was going to do my first show and I wound up uh, you know bruising my rib really bad and from there since I was training I was lean and I figured out like you know that the actual diet process just to get down for a fight because back then you gotta understand let me explain something to you this was before Instagram was around if anybody even knows what that means you know what I mean I, I do okay I know I know what it was like before computers so go ahead <laughs> so you know it was it was a little bit different you know getting out there so you know, that's where, I, you know, my career really started was just, you know, modeling and getting into that from, you know, bodybuilding, that transition from getting hurt and MMA. So what happened was I, I bruised my rib and um, from there, let's see, I did my first show. I think one of my well, friends. Well, well, we got to back up, you know, weight training. Did you start weight training for sports? Were you already weight training all these years? In, to some extent. This is actually a funny story because when I was in 11th grade, it was my first time really touching a weight. I worked out 9th, 10th grade, but you don't know what you're doing then. So I finally found structure when I really, you know, got to the varsity level. And believe it or not, I got almost in a sense too big, you know, going into my senior year. So I was an old conference baseball player and, you know, I, I was expecting to go all county and, you know, really kicking the crap out of everybody, I like to say, because that's how you got to feel when you're going into a sport. You can't think of people all right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, you know, well, I, I wound up, I was, I was just too big. But what happens is, and I found out now, after going back to school and figuring out mechanics, you know, I wasn't really lifting right. And that translates to the field, no matter what sport you're in. So if, you're, if you lose mobility, if you lose posture, you know, if you don't know how to, you know, turn through, you know, your T-spine, the thoracic region, you're really going to be long on your swing. So it affected me a lot of ways. And, you know, I didn't realize what happened. I started out the season so crappy, but then I started running again. I started stretching more and I, I gave up with the weights a little bit. I still worked out throughout my season. I loved it. But as I lost weight and became more mobile, I started getting better. Now, I just thought I was warming up for the season, but it was in a sense I was getting back into the mechanical positioning that I needed to be in to excel in the sport. You know, so that's kind of like, you know, it, I didn't know that back then. I just kind of like put two and two together a couple of years later. But, um, yeah. you know, from there, uh, let's see, I started out the season crappy and I wound up, you know, getting a little bit more agile and I wound up, you know, um, batting about like 400 after oh. starting the season at 200. That's oh. where it kind of hurt. And, you know, lucky enough that year I went all league and it kind of, you know, it kind of helped me back just a little bit into college, which is where I decided to kind of lay it down and go, you know, more for um, something else. Okay. You know? I mean, were you good enough in baseball that you ever entertained the idea of trying out for major league or even minor league? Or, or did you not get to that point? Well, I wanted to play a little bit, you know, in a, in a, in a more I wanted to play collegiate. I'm not going to lie. And I wanted to be a little bit higher than D3. I was going to play for CW Post, which is a D2 college, and it was really good. But. You know, it goes into politics, everything, you know, like I wasn't really helped by my coach. You know, some kids, I felt like the coach was, you know, walking into the college meeting, you know, with these players. And, you know, me, I they just were like, oh, it's mad, you know. <laughs> so a lot of things out there, it's like, you know, you got to really learn from a young age. You got to have a parent or somebody that really could help push you and, you know, get you to another level. Because 
yeah, you could be good and talented, but at the same time, if you're not recognized, you know, you just got to start from the beginning again. And when I got to the, even, you know, I was on the team for, um, you know, the first, the beginning of the season, and it was like I needed to start all over. And I kind of just didn't really even want to do that. That's why I kind of gave up. I didn't give up. I transitioned. Okay. So how did you find bodybuilding? Was it something you were always aware of? Or was it something you found later, like uh, co college or after college years? It's, it's pretty funny. One of my good friends, Matt Gelamino, he was always, uh, he was always ripped. He was a boxer. Hmm. So he did his first show. And we always went to war. I was always pushing weight. And I was bigger. And I would make fun of him for not doing as much on bench. And he would lift up his shirt with ripped abs and be like, Matt, you're fat. Wow. You know, so <laughs> we had a good camaraderie. But at the end of the day, he went to Hawaii to play baseball after he won his first show as a team. Wow. And he was Matt. He goes, you know, aside from all the laughing and joking that we do, he was like, you know, you have a sick body. He's like, I, I, here, here's the show that I did. He gave me the paper. He's like, do it. And I really didn't want to do it at first, but you're going to laugh at this. They gave me a gym period in college. So I was like, you know what? I was like, maybe I'll do some freaking cardio. <laughs> now, that's when I did my cardio. I did it, you know, on school's time, you know, when oh, my nice. gym class. But it kind of worked out in my favor because it kind of got me going. You know what I mean? And yeah. I used him and what he's done for motivation. But also back then, you got to understand, there wasn't really coaches. You know what I mean? I do remember one, and it was Factory, you know? Yeah. And that's the only coach. And like I said, there wasn't social media. So you couldn't just go, you know, to any page and, you know, really figure out what was going on. It was actually really magazines, forums, you know, and, and that's what you would read. You would read the forums and you kind of had to put together your own thought process and what was going on. So I think that's why, like, certain people have a, if you came in, into the sport in a certain time period, you have a little bit more control over your own body, you know, because you had to do it yourself in a sense for a little while. So how old were you and what year was your first show? My first show, I think I was 19 or 20. Okay. It was, uh, was it this INBF na uh, long, Natural Long Island? Is that what you did? Yes, the okay. Long Island Experience. Long Island Experience. What a cool name. <laughs> so, the guy uh, the show, the guy that was dancing, I remember the promoter, it was pretty funny. He did like a whole Madonna theme and he was dressed up in like black leather. So it goes along with the, uh, the show, okay. the experience. Okay. Right? But it was a good show. I'm not going <laughs> to, it's still going on. So, you know. Okay. Wow. So, you know, you grew up in Long Island, am I right? Yep. I mean, that, that's a hotbed of bodybuilding. It has been for many, many years. Um, do you ever, have you, did you ever, or do you get over to Bevan Steve's ever? Believe it or not, I started my career there. I worked there for almost six years, and that's where I kind of really developed my, um, my training career. You know, I, I was one of the only trainers that trained privately in Bev's, and, you know, I thank Steve for the opportunity. He really, you know, got me going when it came to starting my own career um, business-wise because it was just a really good platform for me. And, I, you know, I got to experience... You know, so many people coming down, like, you know, the athletes that come to, uh, you know, guest pose for the shows, you know, I would be hanging out with them, you know, I would just, you know, be involved in a lot of the industry camaraderie. And, you know, that that's something that you can't trade for anything, you know, yeah, they get, you know, they get everyone walking through that place at some point, Mr. Olympia, Ms. Olympia, who were, who are one or two of the people that really stood out to you that inspired you that you saw at Bev's and said, wow, that's, I gotta, I gotta keep doing this. I gotta pursue this. I love this industry. I mean, like, you got to really think there's a lot of people that just come and go, but the real people, the real core people, you know, some people you might not even know, you know what I mean? Regular guys that are just, you know, living the bodybuilding dream that, you know, uh, that inspire even us bodybuilders, you know, like Juan Morel, you know, he's one of the, the main guys that I, I just remember picking his brain and, you know, just watching him lift hard. And it really, you know, it got me in that animal instinct, you know, and. You got guys like Max Charles that were always there. You know, the core guys. I remember, you know, not knocking Guy Green or anything, but, like, you know, he wasn't really there a lot. You know, the core people, you know, they're the people that show up every day, like Juan in the morning, 11 o'clock, and then again at 6 o'clock sharp. He's never late wow. two times a day. And it's, it's just funny. You know what I mean? I mean, some of these guys are coming from New Jersey to Long Island. Some of them come from, like, Brooklyn or the Bronx. You know, I remember hearing stories about how long these drives and the – the Long Island Expressway and oof, it just, uh, I don't blame these guys for not, not being there that often. It sounds like it's, it's not easy to get to. Long Island has some traffic I've heard. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you did your first show in 2009. Most guys either say one of two things. They say, well, that was cool, but you know, I don't need to do that again. Or, or, oh my God, that was awesome. I can't wait to do this again. So which one were you? I was like, I, to tell you the truth, people didn't even really know, like, 
what the bodybuilding scene was. I think I joined the rowing league by accident just because I didn't even know what the freaking MPC was or I would have did my first show in the MPC, natural or not. You know what right, I mean? Right, right, so, right. you know, what happened was a photographer by the name of Jimmy Murtaugh, Alpha Design, you know, I know. Oh, yeah. But you guys know him. But, you know, he really, uh, he, he saw a couple of my pictures and, you know, he took me under his wing. And not only did he, you know, take photos of me that were, you know, awesome that I just remember seeing myself behind the lens and I kind of got addicted to, you know, just getting better from shoot to shoot because it was different back then. You, you know, bodybuilding, it's like, you know, you choose a couple of shows, one, two, three, a year, you know, and, and that's all you, you know, you really get. If not, you know, back in the day, it was like one, you know what I mean? And um, what happened was he took the first round of pictures and a lot of other photographers started noticing me off his page and a lot of other people out there, whether they want to admit it or not. Um, the thing was, you know, I got to travel a lot. All these photographers were like, you know, we'll trade for pictures. And, you know, I would go out to Miami. I would shoot with people there. I would build my portfolio. And like I said, there was an Instagram back then. It was Facebook that you needed a legitimate um, college email to even get on it. You know what I mean? And then it was like I think my that was the days of MySpace. I think that was still around. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, from there, I was able to build a career by just, you know, um, going from shoot to shoot just like it was show to show. So when it actually came out with Men's Physique, it was, it was the same thing, except now I got, a, I got a mainstream platform to kind of take off on. And it was like, it was like a gold mine for me. I was like, this is awesome. You know, now we're not, we're not under the covers anymore. You know, cause it was yeah. tough. Because back in the day, listen, to be a fitness model, what we are now just competitive on stage, you know, you really, it was just like me coming up against guys like Greg Plitt that already had a name and it was a couple of them. You know what I mean? So like, where do you fit in? So for me, or the goal back then was to build a portfolio and then honestly get signed by a professional modeling agency so you could do more of that and get paid for it. You know what right. I mean? So I actually did. I got signed to a top fashion model in, uh, top fashion model in New York City, Red New York. And um, you know, I did that for about a year and that kind of got me involved in you know, just seeing what the other industry was about. Now, I didn't like it too much. It was fun traveling and still keeping in shape, but it wasn't really fitness to me. And then... That year was the first time they came out with the actual men's physique. So I looked at it and I was like, what the hell? I saw some of these uh, models that I would, that I was sir, far, far past. Um, I saw them going pro. I saw them doing well. And I was like, oh shit. I was like, this is, this is for me right now. I was like, I can get away from this. And I was actually worried because I was contractually um, signed to, you know, Red New York City. I didn't know what I could or couldn't do. You know what I mean? So I remember... I watched the first half of the season and I was like, shit, I was like, time's running out. And this is the first men's physique season. I was like, I have to do something extremely bold to stand out, to, to get to this level. And at the time it was pretty crazy. This is, this is, you know, still something that, you know, I can't believe because I did six shows in seven weeks consecutively. Wow. Started off with a, <laughs> and listen, I, I knew that. I said, I need to be bold right now. And the thing was, it wasn't like there were shows in New York. You know, I had to drive to New Hampshire, Boston, you know, and the hardest drive was probably getting to New York City to tell you. <laughs> oh, so you must have done the uh, the Cutler show or the New England that year. I did. I, okay. And that was, that was a really good experience for me. So this is what I would do. I started off at the first Brooklyn and, you know, people like Sadiq, Corey Lagasse, who are pros. I think even Anton Antipov was in that first show. Wow. So. You know, I placed second, and that was the only one of the six that I placed second. And I was like, shit, I was like, I'm, this isn't happening to me again. So I remember, too, I, I don't know why I thought of this. I was like, I was like, we didn't even really know what sponsorships were at the time, but I, I got one of those cheap flips. That's all we had at that time. Camera phones sucked. You couldn't even yeah. use them. So I got the flip, and I'm like, listen, I'm going to go through these crazy times, and I'm going to get this on the flip. And, you know, worst comes to worst, if I don't pro turn pro, I was like, I'm going to have a, a good amount of footage. And I was like, I'm going to get a sponsorship and I'm going to keep running with it. So um, what's it called? I would, I, I, this is how tough it was, too. I did the Brooklyn show. I took a week off. I did some thinking. And then I made the run. So the first show was the New Hampshire show. I don't know if yeah. it's still around. But, um, no, it's gone. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> but for me, I also ran a private supplement store uh, and, and a privately owned supplement store called Shredded RX. So at the time, I was also embedded in the industry you know, through the back end. I knew a lot of reps. I knew a lot of, you know, owners of companies. Not as much yet until I developed in my career. 
But um, I would work all day. I would get off at 9 p.m. I would close the store. I would have one of my friends come and paint me in the back. And then I would drive to whatever state I needed to go to. The first, 9 o'clock, I'm talking at night. So I got off at night. (laughs) Listen to this shit. Mm -hmm. I got off at night, and I drove, I think, five hours to New Hampshire overnight. I stayed in the hotel for a couple of hours, got up in the morning, you know, won the show. And that that show was a little smaller, but that was my first win. So it kind of really... I looked around, I saw some people pumping up, you know, I, it was fun. I even used a shake weight to ah. pump up. You know, that, we didn't know what that was. I bet I was at that show too. I bet I was at that show. You know what, like, you know, I was the kid that was doing push-ups the whole time, almost working out up when, you know, the show just started and you had four hours left. But still, you know, you had no clue what was going on. So it was just, you got to make something out of it. You know, so. Yeah. So you on. finished, you went to, you finished the season in Miami, South Beach for the 2011 Nationals. And uh, even back then, I remember the the classes were just stacked. I mean, what what did they? You were in the A class at that time. I was in the A class, and I even remember now this the, the five shows that I was talking about, and this is why it also was a little bit you know crazy going to nationals because I won five well four consecutive overalls each one of those weeks. Right. So the New Hampshire show, I won the overall. The next week was you know the New England, I won the overall there. The next week, this is the funny one. I was in Jersey at the, um, you know, the end of the East Coast Classic, I think it was. Um, yeah. And I forgot my bathing <laughs> suit. I had three overalls in a row and I forgot my trunks. Oh, and cool. I call home and there was somebody nice enough to drive, get there in time. I don't even know how they got there in time. And I, I put my shorts on and I won the overall. <laughs> wow. So that was, that was a tough one. Do you remember anybody that you beat for the overall? Any of the class winners? Because I bet some of them are names we would know. Um, there was the first show was it was Anthony Scotty, who never really did a show, but to tell you the truth, he looked great. It was actually one of Derek Anthony's uh, old friends, if you mm-hmm. remember DA. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, what's it called? Uh, I'm trying to think who, who won the rest. There was a lot of people that were in the show, but yeah. there was a lot of people that were just developing as you know stars at that time like bradley martin you know all people like that like those famous fitness models even you know that were trying for men's physique at the time you know where he doesn't even need to worry about competing because he's so set but you know that's i guess the platform that men's physique really gives us you know so did you take off 212 uh 212 2012 to improve or did you start competing as a pro right away i started the first show that's why um you know i'm pretty much I, I have firsts for everything in the sport, which I'll go in later. What I want to talk about the Arnold Australia, the first, which is coming up. Oh yeah, and they they finally invited invited men's physique. But backtracking, um, what's it called? Where were we on that? Yeah, so the 2012, you started competing as a pro. Yes, and I remember the first show was Sacramento. And listen, they didn't like us bodybuilders. Of we, course, kinda, we were tw- it was like 12 of us pros at the time. You know what I mean? We almost got into a fight. We had to band together because there was people just just talking shit. I remember, and it's like, yo, you're from you're from Cali. It's like you know you don't know what New York's about to bring here. You know, so <laughs> so did not get a warm reception. Um, but uh, how did that season go for you? Because I, I see by by 2013 you were starting to kick some some butt. But was 2012? Did did you place? Did you win any shows that year? I had a couple of places. I placed fifth at in Orlando Europa, and I remember, you know, Mark Anthony was there at that show. Um, Sadiq wasn't even really in the league yet, and I remember I placed third, which was probably my best look the first year. I'm surprised I even remember that. I remember the selfies; it's like burned into my uh, vision right now. But uh, I placed third at the first Greater Golfs, and I got my first check. That was actually pretty fun, you know. Not gonna lie, but there wasn't an Olympia. Remember the first year, right? Yeah, and our Olympia was basically the um, the New York Pro, which Mark Anthony won. He won the three shows in a row: Pittsburgh, <laughs> Orlando, and um, you know the New York Pro. So at the time, he was a big dog. I find it odd that it took so long. It, there was such a gap between getting into the Olympia when you know Classic was in the Olympia immediately. The first year, it had even an a- amateur shows. Twenty sixteen, it, it already had an Olympia set up, but there was a little gap with you guys. And Ron, but, listen, think. You got to think there wasn't a lot of pros the first year. Mm. Could there possibly be? We had to come together and be like, listen, we got to start this effing sport right now. So we needed that to do every show or almost every show. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. honestly, you got to think of what if two people showed up? We got to travel. We didn't have sponsorships at the time. Wow. It wasn't even barely social media. 
So the thing is, you needed to do this on your own dollar or, you know, how are you going to get there? Yeah. And I was young, so it was different back then, you know? Is this right? You've competed in almost 80 shows now? Yeah. Wow. That's impressive. That's a lot of shows. <laughs> I, think, I think I might be catching up to Dexter somewhere, you know? Yeah. I mean, he's not at 100. He's, he's in the 80s, I believe. He might be at 90 by now. But uh, still, that you're up there. You're definitely up there. So, yeah, 2013 was a great year for you. Uh, you won the Lauderdale Cup. You won the Toronto Pro. So you were the first uh, first guy to win a Men's Physique Pro show outside the USA ever. Uh, gee, what else? The Olympia that year, you were third place at the very first Men's Physique Olympia behind yes. Mark, Mark Anthony Winkson and Jeremy Buendia, mm -hmm. who were hey, both no, multiple not, champions. I think... I'll, I'll say it right now. I think I should have won that show. I, I, I will say that. You know what I mean? I mean, I was just the odd man out. Nobody even knew what I was. I was thankful to be at the Olympia. But once you get your feet on that stage, you speak how you want to speak. It's not like, oh, I'm happy to be there. You know what I mean? It's like I'm coming for blood now. You know, once you get on that stage, it's not a joke anymore. You know? So, you, like I said, to get to another level in anything, you gotta you got to have a little bit of confidence. It's not really being cocky. It's just, you know... Feeling that feeling, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, at, at some point, were you able to get sponsorships and make a living just doing this, or have you always had to do, quote unquote, a real job on top of it? I think most guys in the industry do have to do something outside of just competing. I always, I always had a, a, a good job, and I always really worked hard. But at the same time, you know, it wasn't really serious at the time because I was young. You know, what kind of career are you going to have? You know, when you're young, so. I, I did, I was lucky enough to um, get sponsored by Muscle Sport International, you know, they're an uh, up and coming brand. And, you know, the, the owner just really kind of took me under his wing. I even did a little bit of work for him in a company with R&D, research and development, you know, and it really helped create a couple of products. He gave me, you know, a good chance. And I remember even the first time I placed, it was the first show. I remember, um, I think it was a show in Cali where there was just, it was kind of like a, a mix of placings all over the board. and. You know, I don't think Steve was happy about it. Mm -hmm. So we went into the Orlando Pro, I mean, the Orlando show that year. And I remember I looked awesome, so much better than 2012. And, you know, I, this was tough for me because the, the first call outs at that show were gigantic. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, even Steve was probably trying to prove a point. You know what I mean? And I remember placing like 14th or something around there. And I was like, damn. I was like, you know, I really came with a great package. I, you know, I can't believe the way I looked. I was like, is this even really for me if I can't? you know, win or place a little bit better looking like this. And I remember, and I'm a work, I'm, I work my ass off. I went to this, I, I helped logistics to help everything for my sponsor get there because I was working in the office. When I got there, I was there that day. I set the damn booth up. I took the booth down. I stood there the whole time and worked and I loved it. I mean, I'm action packed. That's my name. It's acting, action. So, you know, put me in the game, coach. You know what I mean? So yeah. I had a good, a good time there, but I remember this was all Jason, the sponsor, my sponsor. He's like, listen, he's like, I know somebody in Pittsburgh. The next show was the Pittsburgh Pro. Mm -hmm. So he's like, no, you know, one of my business guys is out in Pittsburgh. He's like, let's just do it. He's like, I'll take you out there. You know, and I was like, Jay, I was like, let's let's do it. And my first show in first call outs, it was um, Pittsburgh Pro. And I remember um, there was Mark Anthony on the stage. It was like Sadiq. It was like, um, you know, Mike Anderson at the time, which Mike Anderson you know who I'm talking about? The guy with one leg? He lost his leg. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And he's Phil Max. Dude, this guy was unbelievable back then. And we're, even the guys that were winning shows, we're like, who? What the fuck are you? You know what I mean? He was great. Mm -hmm. So I remember they were like, Matt, you know, uh, they called me in first call outs. And, you know, I was like on the edge. And I remember they were like, Matt, stand in between Sadiq and Mark. And you saw me come through the line. And I knew I was, you know, I knew I belonged there. Because I, I went right through them and I was like, this is where, you know, I do belong. And from there, I got that fifth place. It was that momentum that I talked about, you know, and, and it was third place at the New York Pro. And I didn't really know what to do at the time, but the Toronto Pro was the next week. So I was like, listen, I was like, I just got to go. And lucky enough, I did. I remember, you know, a lot of shit went wrong that show. But um, what's it called? I, I, I looked flat. I looked awful in the morning. My food went bad. My... They had to switch me. I, I remember I was leaving LaGuardia and um, nothing was wrong with the plane. I was supposed to leave at 12 in the afternoon. And they were like, yeah, equipment failure. They were like, nothing's taking off for the rest of the day. We got to send, 
I, they were like, yeah, you got to go get your luggage and go to JFK. Oh, God. <laughs> I was like, I got to go through TSA again. That's all I'm talking about. Then I get there. I lose my food. I'm flat in the morning. But the show was at like 12. So I was able to fill up. And by the time I went on stage, I looked great. And wow. that was the first win. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And you missed, missed many meals, a lot of stress. <laughs> Did they took your food away at uh, JFK? You said? Well, it went bad just because the trip was so long, and mm. I didn't even know how to pack back then. Now I'm an expert at it. You know, forget about it. It's been almost a hundred times. I mean, <laughs> Bill Heath lost uh, one of his first Olympias because of bad tilapia, so it can happen. Yeah, food poisoning is no joke. Uh, I'm curious. Did, did you always feel that the standards, the judging standards, were consistent, or sometimes you, you didn't know what they were looking for? Is, I'm sure it took a couple of years for men's physique judging just like classic to really figure out what they were looking for exactly do you feel like uh, men's physique ever got to that point where it was very clear what they wanted you to look like yeah but i'm a bit of a wild child so i never gave a shit i always <laughs> said that they're gonna be looking for me when i look the way i need to look you mm -hmm. know what i mean and that's the way i started out because there wasn't standards back then. If you thought there were standards, that means you're trying to look like somebody else. So I said, no, they're going to be looking like me. You know what I mean? And, you know, when you're the, the first in that particular, you know, time period, you better believe it. Or you're going to have to look like somebody else. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Do you feel like the, the physiques have gotten a lot bigger since men's physique started back in 2011? Definitely. And, you know, I don't want to say like, uh, you know, like, it, it, it's it's changed. It has changed. You know, we've gotten bigger. We've gotten, you know, more conditioned. But at the same time, we were all young back then. And you watched us progress through the sport. How are you going to work out, do everything perfect all year, and then come back on the stage the next year looking the same like the last year? It's just impossible. So that's the way I saw the sport evolve. It wasn't so much as stuff changed. It's just that the top guys in the sport that started it, we just grew mm -hmm. like the division. And then eventually, you know, we, like, Jeremy, his last show, that, I mean, he could keep growing, but, you know, that's where we ended up. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you feel like a lot, I mean, when I watch these men's physique division now, I see guys that I think, you know, they still have the small waist and the wide shoulders, the abs, but a lot of them, it seems to me, not a lot of them, but there's, there's always a few that I say, that guy looks like a straight up bodybuilder with just, yeah, he just happens to have a small waist. And I, a lot of times, sometimes the judges mark them down for it, and sometimes they don't. So that's where I get confused is, you know, uh, like I was at the Tampa Pro a couple, what was that, about two months ago. And uh, Tyler Mannion gave a big speech at a competitor's meeting. He told some of these guys, said, some of you guys are getting too big. If you want to keep getting bigger, classic, go to classic because we don't want you looking like bodybuilders. You know, you're, it's supposed to be like the perfect beach body. So, you know, with anything, women's physique, women's bodybuilding. You know, any time you have a, a certain standard, it keeps getting pushed as years go by because people will get bigger and bigger and bigger unless you put a stop to it. You know, do you feel like there's a point where, because there are no weight restrictions for you guys, you don't have to weigh in. Uh, how do how do you know as a men's physique competitor if you're getting too big for the division? You know, I you should know when you're getting too big, but at the end of the at the end of the day, it comes down to also. I feel like conditioning is part of our sport you know you just have to have the, the look you know there's guys that are, are bigger but they're more you know streamlined mainstream looking and then there's guys that are just maybe even smaller but they're just their shape is just meant for bodybuilding they're harder they're they don't have the roundness you know and yeah sometimes there's a little bit of inconsistency but you know that's when usually a guy doesn't like the guys that are a little smaller they need to show up on point two if you have all the guys showing up like crap and there's a guy that's bigger that looks amazing, you know, like, you got to think, like, you know, where where is credit due at that point? You know, just because that guy didn't come in cheap and he, you know, looks, he was the men's physique standard. It's like he has a job to do and he didn't do it. So you got to, you got to, you know, there's a lot to take into consideration. It is tough as the judges, you know, critique it. But there is a line where you do get too big. You know, I think, I think. You'll know it when you see it. Like, obviously, I can't say. I don't want to throw out a name, but you, you know when somebody's too big. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, have you always been determined to stay in men's physique? Or when Classic came along, did you entertain the idea of trying that out? Well, listen, I love bodybuilding, and I love posing. That's where I started. I started, you know, I, I posed uh, with a, an old-school guy, and believe it or not, diet and cardio wasn't the issue. 
we posed for two hours a session and I almost didn't compete because I was like, dude, screw this posing. I was like, yeah. this shit is hard. This is worse than working out cardio and doing all this other stuff. And you know, that's the funny part. I like, I like posing. I like the, you know, the presentation, you know, but the, at the end of the day, I am a bodybuilder, you know, and that's what mm. people don't understand. We're all building our bodies. It's just, you know, yeah, I'm on stage with, with board shorts. However, you know, listen, I have seminars, interviews, uh, magazines. Listen, you got to look the part. You can't ha not have legs. You know what I mean? Or you just won't make it. You know, the stage, I feel like, yeah, it's, it's just a portion of our, our career. You know what I mean? But everything comes together on the outside, you know, too. I, I feel like that's that's just a portion of who we are. And always, you know, I just... Now, uh, uh, I recall hearing from someone you know that you work some crazy hours running. Uh, you run the training program at a place called Export. Yeah. A club. So what kind of hours are we talking about that you put in on a daily basis? Well, I mean, <laughs> I don't want anybody to get all crazy thinking I'm dying on them or anything. But I, I usually get in at around 7 or 8 in the morning. And I'll leave at around eight, eight or nine at night. You know, so listen, for me, I'm not going to, I'm not working the whole time. You know, I'll have, you know, three, four, sometimes five hours through, out of that, you know, 13, 14 hour span where I might, you know, have hour break here or combine a couple of hour breaks so I could get a lift in. But, you know, at the end of the day, I do have some days where I only have one break. You know what I mean? And I'm servicing almost 12, 13 clients a day. But listen. It's something that I choose to do, and I freaking love this. And now I'm able to have a career and, and, you know, really, you know, get what this sport has given me. You know, I, I do well, and there's nothing I would change for it because every day I'm in that gym, I'm helping somebody. And that goes all back into my injury. You know, after I got hurt, I like I said, I really needed to learn how to work out again. And going through, you know, the certifications, the continued education, working with, you know, all these doctors, physical therapists, you know, all the people in the industry that helped put me back together, you know, I was able to really harness my career in fitness as a specialist. You know what I mean? So me, I, I call myself, I'm the extension of a physical therapist. You know what I mean? I'm a movement specialist. I help people, you know, some people, they can't turn around, even grab the seatbelts. Some people can't get up off the ground. You know, I got to piece them together and, and have them moving efficiently and functionally so they could enjoy life, quality of life. You know, but same goes into bodybuilding. We all need to reinforce the same things, posture, hips, core. A lot of things are forgotten nowadays. And it's a matter of just going in and using sheer will in the gym. And I could understand, I used to do the same thing. I used to lift harder than I should have. Like, not, it's not harder than I should have, but stupider than I should have. You know what I mean? So, like, I, I just needed to relearn my mechanics and strengthen the imbalances, correct the imbalances. You know, really... To, to, to change my career, get me back on the stage. But at the same time, I learned the real value of training and how to become a successful trainer and make a career out of it through my injury, you know? We don't know what the injury was. Let's talk about what happened. Well, I didn't, do, I didn't really do anything in specific. It was just forward head posture. I, I wound up, I, I, I had a bulging disc in my cervical, C2. So I remember there was a period in time where I couldn't even really grab like a, a half gallon of milk out of the fridge, like my arm was almost dead. I lost a lot of upper chest thickness, a lot of upper like traps because that, you know, part of your C2 correlates with all that. And I, and around, I wound up losing a lot of muscle up there and I always had a great chest. I always had a great back. But even now you could tell I finally got my upper chest back, but I still need to get that region around my neck and my traps going. My upper traps, they're like disappear. I have stakes hanging off my lats and then I got nothing up top and it just, you know, the balance is everything when it comes to symmetry in, in men's physique. And, you know, I could come into a show extremely ripped and still, you know, like I placed third at the Toronto Pro this year. I look amazing, but I still have little, you know, details that I got to tune in to really just bring the overall, you know, aesthetics and the overall symmetry and shape down. And sometimes it's not size. You know, I like to say this, like Flex Lewis was the same weight each year, but look at the beginning of his career and look at how he's progressed. So you got to say, what could you do with your weight? Where could you add it? What could you focus on? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's a bulging, it's a bulging disc, a herniated disc. Uh, I mean, is there anything that surgically can be done or have you just had to do your own physical therapy? How have you resolved it? Well, for me, it was obviously after you herniate or bulge anything, you know, you, you just come back to life eventually. But for me, you know, I couldn't go back to, you know, hard and heavy lifting because I lost a lot of what I had and I couldn't do it the same way. 
because it just didn't work. You know what I mean? So like I said, I needed to fix my alignment because everything I was doing, well, I was working out out of alignment. And you got to look at yourself as a machine. You know, we're, we're an engineering system, the smartest engineering system. So, you know, when you have, when you, a machine operates out of position, you're going to have drag. Now the drag, it doesn't take the machine, you know, it doesn't take it down right away. It's going to corrode over time. Now drag in us is inflammation. If you're moving out of position, you know, you're, 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 you're angering the body. So if we're internally rounded and we're not focusing on certain things, you know, we're stabilized. A lot of us, almost all of us stabilize movement in our AC joint. That's really where the front, the, the traps or our neck, that's not what it's meant for. If you watch a monkey or a gorilla, anytime they pick something up, all of a sudden they're right through their back. They're holding it perfectly. They move like robots. Wow. You know, the thing is like, we're meant to do something a specific way. And you know, I know there's the old guy, oh, I like to do it like this because it feels good. But at the same time, you need to do this in the correct position to get what you need out of it. Or yeah, you could still grow, but what you're also growing is negative movement patterns that are associated with, you know, that particular movement. And that carries over into life and that's pain and it's, it, it, it decreases quality of life. You know what I mean? I'm not going to lie. I mean, so are you out of pain now? I'm still working on it. I'm still working on getting my neck back into alignment um, because you go through stages. I focus on certain things and, you know, learning certain things, you know, in pieces. So obviously, you, you know, you have break it down. You got the hips, you got the core, you know, you got to really figure out how to use everything. And, you know, one of the forgotten things is, is obliques. You know what I mean? We're rotational beings. We're, if I hold something out here, you got anti and counter rotation. You know, when, when we're, we're advanced because we have all these fibers in our core going in all different directions, we need to train like that. But when you see people do abs, it's rectus abdominis and that's yeah. all you do, you know? So the thing is, how is that going to make you grow? I mean, how is that going to help your posture if you're continuously doing that? Meanwhile, you have your obliques. If you look at one of the, you know, what the physiology of the muscle, one of the um, one of the reasons why it's there is to help spinal flexion and to help you posture upright. So the thing is, like, you got to know what's going on because when we go to the gym, sometimes we tend to do what we want to do and what we like to do. You know, and we you know we ignore certain things. But this was me. I even didn't do abs for so long. You know what I mean? Because I was ripped. I was an athlete. But at the end of the day, your lower back starts stabling all the movement. You come into lower back extension and then you lose control of your core. You know what I mean? So on stage, I needed to crunch like an accordion. And I was always ruining my waistline because I didn't have core strength. You know what I mean? It was, you know, now I realize all this. So have you basically, you know, figured out how to adjust all your training and in such a way that you can, you know, get your physique back to exactly the way you want it to? better than ever. And now, listen, I'm 31. I feel and move better than I did. Just a kid. <laughs> 31. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. But I do. I feel better than I did when I was 20. The only thing that happens when you're 20, you're able to just, you're invincible. So if you have inflammation, it goes away. You don't feel the pain that's going on. You know, now it's kind of like, you know, I, I, I just, I feel great day to day. You know, I, I don't have a lot of aches and pains. You know what I mean? And back then, you know, you think you need to leave the gym in a wheelchair, you know, you really don't like, you know, that's, uh, that's on leg day anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, yeah. Leg day. I could understand, but you know, still like you, you'd want to destroy the muscle, but you don't want to put, you know, um, unneeded tension in areas that, you know, aren't meant for it. What did Lee Haney always say? Stimulate, don't annihilate. Yeah. Wise and man. There will be people that hate that saying, but at the end of the day, you know, to each his own, yeah. you know, so Matt, what is next for you? What are you thinking? Well, since we were talking about firsts and, you know, they, they just dropped the announcement of the uh, Australia uh, Arnold, yeah. I don't, I would, listen, the first Arnold was invite only and they invited 10 of us and I was lucky enough to do the first Arnold in place fourth. That's right. So I'm thinking that, you know, me being who I am, I'm like, yo, I hope they don't do this invite only. I, I don't know if they dropped that yet or not. But I want to go out there. I've always wanted to go to Australia. I've always wanted to be a part of that expo. And finally, I had men's physique. So, hell yeah, that's probably going to be my first show. Yeah. I, mean, I, I believe you apply for that. And, you know, they, they look at different applicants. And, you know, you've got quite a track record, quite a resume. I, I can't imagine Tony Doherty wouldn't want you in a show. Tony, if you're watching, come on. That's pretty. <laughs> that's one of the OGs. Me. <laughs> He's one of the last guys from the, uh, the original era left and still and still doing it at a high level. I think I think I am the only year one guy competing right now. 
if I look at the lineup of the 2013 Olympia and so on, yeah, I don't think any of those guys are still doing this. Yeah. Pretty intense. Mm. Yep. Mm. So that's it. Arnold, Australia. I mean, maybe are you going to try to get back into Arnold, Ohio or no? Well, the, the Arnold, Ohio, listen, I mean, I want to do that show, but I also, you know, I want to break onto the scene again. You know, sometimes there's 40, 50 guys in that show. And like I said, I come from a time where the first show was 10 guys and it was invite only. So I don't want to be, I don't want to get like kind of get down on myself, you know, getting mixed up in a, in a herd of, you know. Yeah, actually, because now that I think of it, I think uh, that division at the Arnold, it's open to anyone that wants to do it. It's not, they don't limit it to 10, 15 or even 20. Because I do remember like 35 guys in that. Classic Physique also had like 35 guys. Few divisions were just packed and men's physique was definitely one of the packed divisions. Um, so yeah, but Australia, hmm, who wouldn't want to go to Australia? Come on. It's a good time. And listen, after 80 shows or it's probably around like 70, 80, I'm not going to lie. I don't think I broke 80 yet. I got to close. Let, let's round off, round up. <laughs> um, you know, I, I want to travel to places that I haven't been, you know, like, uh, I might even debut with the Hawaii show mm -hmm. just because I love, you know, Tim Gardner productions. He always puts on an amazing show. Uh, and who wouldn't want to go to Hawaii? You know what I mean? That's, that's the other thing. So, Hawaii, come on. Everybody wants to go to Hawaii. <laughs> okay. Um, so I want everyone to make sure they follow you. You've got the coolest name ever on Instagram. Action Man Matt. Action Man Matt. Where, where'd you get that nickname, Action? I mean, it's pretty... I, I guess it's not that hard to, to figure out, but who first gave it to you? It started off as... This is funny. It goes back. When I was playing baseball, they used to call me um, Tough Acton to Acton. I mean, you know, like, yeah, yeah, I know it's a uh, foot spray, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's with me. Yeah. And then when I, was, uh, when I did my first show, you know, they were like, it was my first show. I didn't even know what to expect. Everybody was like, you look like an action figure, you know? And I was like, yeah, my last name's Action. I was like, you know, this is my work. So uh, I kind of pieced everything together. And, you know, when Instagram came out, when it came out, I, I got in there and I was like, all right, I like it. Yeah, I'm surprised you never threw an O and had your name legally changed to action just for the, uh, you probably wouldn't, it's a family thing. You probably wouldn't want to insult your family, but. You know, when I cross over to like, you know, being a porn star, you know, that I'll throw the action in there. Mad action. Yeah. It's like a well, porn star. Be, well, you can't be an action movie star with the name of action. That's too obvious. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll go for it. All right. So that is where any other, uh, any other social media or anything you want people to check out? Um, well, I have my YouTube that I really haven't, you know, been on in a while, but it's Matt Acton NY. And I have old videos of me coming up there but you know at the end of the day like i'm not social media is tough because when you work this much and you know you're working with people in in person you know it's tough to really you know get stay on your phone all day i can't even get back to texts you know what i mean <laughs> let alone <laughs> let alone yeah. social media but i i work i work with a lot of people and i do a lot of great things and you know for me to pull out my phone and you know <laughs> I, it, that's not even going to be the great thing that I do all day. You know what I mean? Whatever's yeah. happening, it's just, it's happening at that moment. So when somebody decides to sponsor me and they want to follow me around with a camera, maybe. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'll do a lot more, you know, but that's, it's, it's tough. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy that social media has taken on such a prominence in our sport where you think, this is a sport. You, why do you need to be posting all day and provide, making new content for day? I, I'm, a, I'm an athlete. Why do I have to worry about all this? But that's, you know, you can't, you can't argue with it. That's just the way it's, uh, the way it is now. Everyone has to have a presence on social media and, you know, be interacting with their fans if, if you want to be relevant. Yeah, 100%. Regardless of how many titles you win and everything else. So get on your social media game a little bit more, Matt. Come on. <laughs> and I never really in, all that, in all that spare time you have. You know, it's like you take out your phone and you start talking in a crowd of people. You know, people start looking at you. I just don't like that feeling, man, you know. <laughs> Yeah, like I'm not, I have no shame, but at the same time, that's that's like not not even part of my world. So, right like mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do it when nobody's looking. I'll sneak one in. <laughs> okay. So theoretically, we're going to see you on stage, hopefully in Melbourne, Australia, mm -hmm. March of 2020 next. So that'll be uh, geez, 12, 13. That'll be your eighth, eight year, eighth season as a pro, eighth or ninth, something like that by that point. Yeah. Which, like I said, I don't think there's too many guys that are in their eighth or ninth season as men's physique pros. Most of them have uh, most of them have kind of gone the way of the the dodo bird at this point, or moved on to other things. So anyway, I wish I wish you luck. I hope Tony Darty, if you if you catch this, 
I would I would really like to see Matt on that stage. I'm sure you would you would uh, not regret the decision. He's going to be a great addition to your show. And uh, yeah, he's he's proven proven his medal, as we like to say, over many many shows and winning many times and placing highly many other times. So, uh, any any parting words for your uh, fans out there, Matt? You know, it, it it started with a dream, and you know, all you got to do is really keep focusing on it. And like I said, keep a full time job while you're chasing your dream. You know, a lot of you, you people out there, you know, it's like let's try to get a sponsorship or this or that, and. You know, you really got to focus on on life, and and when you focus on life, you know the stage really does work out better because you know you're not you know you're not looking at the stage like like a crack addict. And listen, I've been there. You know what? I was obsessed. One show, I got to make up for it. I got to do another one, and I'm out in another. You know, take your time. You know, pick out your shows carefully. Enjoy what you're doing. You know, there's been a lot of times where I missed out on a lot of life and living in my twenties just because I had you know a crazy dream and I went you know. I just was unorganized at certain times and you know, you got to find that balance. And when I work hard and I'm, and I'm working all these hours, I do better on stage, Ron. So it keeps me focused. Wow. Wow. Just got to find time for sleep. That's it. You know? Cool. Well, it's, it's crazy that you're so young. I, I assumed you were older just because you've been around and doing this so long, but man, you were just, you really were just a kid when you started doing all this. It's crazy to think so. Well, anyway, thank you for your time, Matt. Uh, it was cool to learn a little bit more about you because I've been seeing you at shows for a very long time, even before you were pro, apparently, didn't even realize it. So uh, that's all. Thanks, everybody, for watching Ron Line Report with Matt Acton, Men's Physique Pro, and you'll be seeing him again on stage very soon. Thank you, Ron.